Do you want to learn the tricks that top leaders use to get the most out of themselves and their teams? Well, Naftali Hoff is here to help. Lead to Succeed picks the brains of top leaders to learn about their challenges, insights, and best practices. Here's Naftali. Hello, Lead to Succeed Nation. It's Naftali Hoff, and welcome to Lead to Succeed Episode 44. Today, I have the pleasure with speaking with John Corcoran. John is an attorney and a former Clinton White House writer and speechwriter to the governor of California. Throughout his career, he has worked in Hollywood, the heart of Silicon Valley, and owned his own boutique law firm in the San Francisco Bay Area, working with small business owners and entrepreneurs. He is the creator of Smart Business Revolution and the Smart Business Revolution podcast. You want to check that out for sure. He's a co-founder of Rise25 LLC an education and training company which holds in-person and virtual trainings for e-commerce entrepreneurs and professional service business owners. And I must tell you, I have seen John in a variety of different ways, got to connect with him. His stuff is great. You definitely want to check him out. We'll have plenty of opportunity to learn more about him as we talk. John, thanks so much for being on the show today. Naftali, thanks for having me. It's my pleasure. So I, I'm, I'm really interested in a lot of your bio, but I want to start with where we, where we kind of got started, which was your profession as a lawyer. But I, as I just mentioned before, know you as a networking guru, as a marketing expert, as somebody who's really leveraged your connections, your ability to um, really get to know people and use those relationships to build your business and help them build theirs as well. So, so talk me through the process. You know, in my own little world, my background is in education. So I was a teacher and a school leader before I became a coach. To me, it's not such a jump from one to the other. I think I've used a lot of the skills in both industries. Sure. But the big jump for me was all the back-end stuff, getting the website up, getting my social yeah. media going. I was really not a social media user whatsoever. Um, yeah, you don't really need it when you're a teacher. Right, exactly. <laughs> yeah. um, and, I, and my email list didn't really exist and, and on and on and on. Now, thankfully, yeah. I had writing skills and I'd been writing and contributing articles for years. I had presentation skills and I had done professional development for many years. And that's what I use sort of as my foundation moving forward. But I still realized that as I became, and I'm still learning this, as I want to do online courses or whatever I want to do, that yeah. you're constantly learning new skills or you have to, mm -hmm. especially for somebody like myself and I think somebody like you as well. So talk us yeah. through the, the skill building process, if you will. How did you move from law, which you still do and still practice, but you know most people would think that that's not necessarily a networking field per se. You may need to network yeah. here and there, but it's not, you, you don't necessarily need to become um, an expert. I mean, I might be wrong on this, but many people might yeah. think that way. How does someone like you pivot in such a seemingly dramatic way to become such an expert in other spaces? Yeah. So it, it was a gradual process. So it, it definitely wasn't overnight. Um, it, it took a while, longer than I expected it, it to do. And um, you know, as far as, you know, you asked about what, uh, you know, tr educating yourself and, and, and learning about all the different tools and technologies, and you can definitely overdo it. I see a lot of people do that. They spend a lot of time and money on education, going to conferences, buying courses, things like that, and not as much action taking. So you have to definitely balance those two between education. I'm a big believer in just, just in time education. Like you don't necessarily need to learn everything. You could, it's, in the entrepreneurial world, you can spend forever learning about what does a $10 million business need to know to go to $100 million. And that might be interesting to you, but if you're way below that, you don't need to know it yet. So what are you doing? You know, Don't waste your time with that. Be focusing on getting the next client or whatever it is. So you know, for me, with the transition from law to, to other things, and by the way, kudos to you for asking about my role as a lawyer first. I never get asked about that. Oh, really? <laughs> that's like the most boring thing I've done. Uh -huh. <laughs> no, usually people aren't even interested in that. So that's cool that you asked about it. But um, I mean, it is one of the more challenging things I did. And, and the transition 
you know, it took a while. So, so basically, I mean, you know, when I was practicing law, I started a blog on the side and it kind of it originated out of, I wanted to write a book. I'd always been a writer and be interested in that. And the advice that everyone gave me was, well, if you want to write a book, you need to start a blog because that's how you build an audience. You need an audience in order to sell a book. So I did that and I started the blog and I realized it was a lot harder to get an audience behind a blog. So I really just went down the rabbit hole like, well, how do you build an audience behind a blog? And you need to build an email list, right? Well, how do you build an email list? You know, and so I just kind of kept on. on going down. Yeah. yeah, down more and more and figuring out like how to kind of build an audience behind it. And it took a while. Originally, I was writing about legal topics because I was trying to get legal clients. Mm-hmm. And I realized that was really boring and no one stuck around. They would read something and then keep going. So then I pivoted to writing about entrepreneurial topics. That was still too broad. And then I got advice from other people who basically it was, you know, it took, came from other people saying like, John, you're really good at connecting with people and networking. And, you know, they kind of connected the dots for me. They're like, you know, throughout your career, you've done this. You know, you, I went from like, I got a BA in English at a party school to like a year later, I'm writing the president's words at the White House. That's pretty unusual. Yes. I was not the smartest. I didn't go to an Ivy League school or anything like that. You know, it was all about connections that got me there and, and each of my different roles. And so that's what I started writing about. And when I started focusing on that particular niche, that's when things really kind of took off for me. Yeah. And it's interesting because I I would love if we had more time, I'd love to unpack how you got to work with President Clinton and the governor of California yeah. and all of that. Well, I think I'm going to... Let me tell you the story because there's a relevant story about how I got the White House job. So first of all, during college, I did an internship program. You know, a lot of colleges have internship programs in Washington, D.C. So I did that. And I just went straight and I applied to different internships. So you go to D.C. for a semester, basically, and you, you study, uh, you work most of the time and you get credit, academic credit for it. And so I worked at the White House and I was in the speechwriting office. This was a fall in 1997. It was before we even knew who Monica Lewinsky was because it was right before that uh-huh. happened. Um, and, and I was there for, uh, you know, a semester and I just worked my butt off and tried to make the best impression possible. Uh, I get back to college January, 1998 and immediately <laughs> flashing news, uh-huh. Lewinsky scandal starts and I have, you know, MSNBC and I have, you know, New York times and Washington post and all these reporters calling and leaving, you know, I'd come home from the class and my roommates would be like, you've got a message from the New York times, Washington, wow. <laughs> you know, like all these different things. So it was crazy. And so anyways, I, I graduated from college. I actually go and work in the entertainment industry for a little bit. I'm working for DreamWorks and some other roles. Uh, but at the same time, I wanted to come back to Washington, D.C. So I kept in touch with the uh, speech writers. I wanted to get a writing job because I liked writing. And I, I would deliver value to them. So it wasn't, like, it wasn't like I was calling or emailing them regularly and saying, hey, is there a job? Is there a job? Because they don't exactly advertise these positions on Craigslist, mm-hmm, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, I, I would just like send them quotes and articles and things like that that I thought would be helpful to the speechwriters. And because I delivered value like that, because I kept in touch, because I followed up with them, when an opportunity came along, one of them ended up telling me about it. The other funny story about it is I get the heads up that uh, from one of the other speechwriters that there's this position. He tells me that the person who's hiring for it is probably going to be giving me a call. A couple of days later, they give me a call and they say, hey, just introduces herself. This is who became my boss, the woman who became my boss. And it tells me about it, says she wants to get my resume, writing samples, stuff like that. And I said, okay, great. I'm happy to send that stuff. And by the way, if you'd like a writing sample, if you open up today's New York Times, New York Times to the opinion page, I have a letter to the editor that's on that page today. It was a little bit of a coincidence. But I knew that she might be calling and I'd sent in a letter to the editor. It just happened to hit on that particular day. Nice. If she called me like the next day, it probably would have been like, you know, a, a letter in the Akron Daily Herald or something like uh-huh. that that I had published on that day. You know, but New York Times happened to hit. So the point behind that is you can often position yourself for success if you know there might be an opportunity by planning in advance. Yeah, that's great. I actually had a conversation this week where somebody who I'd done work in the past told me that there wasn't anything that he needed for me at the moment. But I still wanted to stay in touch. Gave him a call. We're having a conversation. It ends very pleasant. Shortly afterwards, he calls me back, maybe the next day, and he says, oh, top of mind, I have something. I really want to talk about this. And we had that conversation. So just being current, staying in in touch with people, like you said, adding value. All of these are are really good, regardless of whatever industry it is. Because at the end of the day, we do business with who we like. We do business with people we trust. So if I like you and I trust you, I feel that you, and frankly, I will do business with you if I like you, even if I don't trust you as much, 
as maybe somebody else who's a little bit better or maybe even a lot better if the relationship is strong and I have a reason that I want to support you or bring you in or whatever that looks like. So keeping totally. top of mind, yeah. keeping adding the value, I think is critical. And those are great. Uh- that's a big lesson I learned from working in politics early in my career is the importance of those relationships. And, you know, if you flash forward from the White House, I ended up going and becoming a speechwriter for the gov- governor of California at the time. His name was Gray Davis. And um, at the time, he was an up and coming governor. People were talking about maybe running for president one day. Um, it ended up ending rather spectacularly when Arnold Schwarzenegger decided to hop into the recall uh-huh. election in 2003. And so we suffered, you know, I lost my job. It was my own personal dot-com failure, so to speak. And um, I was out of a job. But for, you know, I had a number of colleagues who, uh, they went like six months or more without a job because they just hadn't, you know, built the right relationships, maintained the right relationships. And I feel very fortunate that I basically walked into another job. I had another job opportunity right after that you know, really devastating experience. Yeah, it's so, it's so important something. that you mentioned that. I don't mean to cut you off, but if I may for a second, um, yeah. <clears throat> I, I think that oftentimes, and, and I, I struggle with this a lot, a lot of coaches do, a lot of other uh, um, service professionals, you know, we get a gig, you know, we get work, whatever it might look like, and then we just jump in and we want to do the work, but we have to constantly be mindful of how do I continue to make myself relevant to people down the road? Because forgetting yeah. even service providers, even if you have a regular position where you're nine to five or eight to 10, whatever that might look like for you, right. you know, there's no guarantee that you're going to be in that position long term. And where are you going yeah. to turn if you need to? look for something different. But if you'd stay current and relevant that entire time with people, like you said, and you experience, you're much, it's much easier for you, I would think, for you to find something on the back end than if you're just Absolutely. sort of irrelevant and all of a sudden now you need to start looking again. It's one of the challenges, right? You know, you get busy with client work and you still have to do marketing and networking to keep your your voice out there and keep top of mind with other people or else, as you said, when that work ends, then you're going to be stuck looking for something. You know, we've probably all gotten emails from people. I know I have you know, every couple of years. There's some people that I get emails from. It's like, Hey, how you doing? I haven't heard from you in a while. So, um, I lost my job and I'm looking for a job and it's, you feel a little bad for them, but I'm also kind of like, where you been? Right. Like, you're asking me to do something. You're asking me to like, go find you a job now. And you haven't, remained in touch with me at all. You don't care about me. You only care about me when you're in a, in a pickle, you know? Yep. And so you, you, it's really ne- necessary to do that. It's actually one of the reasons that I really like what we're doing right now, which is podcasting, which yeah. is doing interviews. Mm-hmm. It's a tremendous way to build relationships with people and to create content, which you can then share across social media, which then allows you to remain top of mind which all the, with all the people that you're connected with on social media. That's exactly right. And if, you know, just in full disclosure, one of the reasons that I do this and one of the reasons that I love to get great people like you on the show is because I want, for me, it's one of my Trojan horses, if you will. It's like, I want to have a it great conversation, be. but I also want to, you know, the, people, yeah. people who are busy and successful, which are the people I target for the podcast, they're not yes. going to respond to me if they don't know who I am in most cases. No. You know, I'm like a regular email, it's a cold call, it's that kind of thing. But if I come in and I say, I've got a podcast, I've got a platform, yeah. it's a great way to get to know you, but get to know you in a way that adds immediate value to you, not just what's good for me, but what's good for us. Because yeah. I get to know you, you get to know me, but you also get to have your message resonate to a broader audience. And maybe you don't have the norm, you have the platform, but many right. people don't. <laughs> yeah, so I did for so, that. Yeah. Yeah. So this is actually something that um, it's not f- fully apparent on our Rise Smart High website, but this is actually something that we do for clients is actually setting up and maintaining podcasts for people. And the reason we got into that was because my business partner and I, we've been podcasting for 15 years between the two of us. And for a number of years now, we've done live events and we've done coaching and we helped individuals and we really boiled down to, especially over the last couple of years, we were like, you know what? you really need to start a podcast. That just became our advice over and over again. It kind of became a joke, you yeah. know? People would ask questions like, how do I connect with this person? How do I get more referrals? How do I get more leads? How do I blah, blah, blah? And we ultimately were like, you need to start a podcast. But there are certain objections that people have. And so ultimately, we started just doing it for people to remove the excuse. We were like, here, use our team. We have a team that can do it. But, you, you know, and what's other, well, the other thing that's smart about what you said is that you have a business backing it up. So the uh, some people, when they do podcasts, they it's not connected to their business. 
that they're not new. They're not deliberate about it. They're interviewing a bunch of people that aren't potential clients for them, which I think is a mistake. I think you should be interviewing potential clients and actual clients and past clients and referral partners and all that kind of stuff. And it's a tremendous tool for all of those, all of those reasons. Yeah. yeah. And I love it. And I really, I had a lot of those obstacles as well. I mean, I'm not going to go through the whole process. And I did post on my blog about this, like how I got to develop, to, to um, begin the podcast when it was really a foreign, I wouldn't say foreign concept, but certainly something foreign for me in terms of my ability to produce it. And I started actually, when I wrote my book, Becoming the New Boss, I started guesting on other people's podcasts to put the yeah. word out there. And I, I, I learned a little bit about the process. And then I would ask them, can I interview you or can I survey, you, you know, ask you some survey or interview type questions to get more information about the platforms you use and, you know, what are the different behind the scenes elements that I should know about so that I can launch this and launch it successfully. And so in many cases, it's just a matter of who's doing something really well already and how do I tap into their experiences and their success? You know, there's a, a joke, a, a, so it's a story, but it leads to a joke that I often tell about a, um, a, a, a newspaper writer and he comes to a, a successful banker and he says, sir, you've been super successful over the years. How have you accomplished everything? And he says, easy, two words, good decisions. And so he continues and he says, well, that's wonderful, but how do you make good decisions, right? Not everybody can do it. And the mm -hmm. banker responds, one word, experience. And then he continues and says, well, that's great as well, but how do you get experience? And he says, two words, bad decisions. <laughs> and so in essence, that's really what it is, you know? So right. I wrote my book in order to shorten people's experience um, runway a little bit. In other words, don't yeah. make all the same mistakes I made in effect. And so I think that the more that anything we're trying to do, whether it's becoming um, better on social media, a stronger communicator, building our business, don't try, like you said, don't try to reinvent the wheel. Go with what already has been working for people. Find a mentor, find people you could turn to and, and tap into their experience and their insight and then learn from them. Well, and that's another reason that I do love the format of, of uh, podcasting. I say that it's like personal and professional development that doubles as marketing. It sure does. You know, there's no better way to educate yourself on whatever you're interested in than to ask some of the experts to come on your podcast yeah. and explain it to yeah. you and give you the opportunity to ask your own personalized questions, which often are related to your own personal interests. Yeah. You know? And you know, it's interesting it, because I, I just, I had hired somebody to write up my show notes, which I post on my website when I release the content. And then I stopped. And the reason I stopped is I wanted to listen to it again and I wanted to really kind of tease out the insights that I felt would be most useful for me personally. So really to your point. Well, I think that's admirable that you do that. I still disagree. I still think you should have someone doing the show notes for you. But I, I'm a personal believer that when it comes to the podcast, that what you should be doing is focusing on reaching out to new guests and connecting with the guests and everything else around it. Because there's a crap, as you know, crap load of other stuff, excuse my language, that you have to do around a podcast from show notes, audio editing, all that kind of stuff. All that stuff, people should delegate. They shouldn't be doing with it because all if people end up they end up getting discouraged and they're sick of doing it and they stop doing it. Yeah. You know, whereas like the connecting piece, that's really what you can't delegate and really what people should. Focus I do on. agree. I have somebody doing all the editing, show notes for now. I'm doing. We'll Good. see. We'll see where it goes. We'll see where it goes. Good. Let's let's pivot a little bit. And um, so so tell us a little bit if you can. What are some of the secrets you use when you communicate? Like, how do you, how do you use communication to really build relationships, especially for people you haven't gotten to know very well just yet? Like, yeah. So, I mean, I guess at its simplest form, it's taking interest in others and focusing on the other people's other person's challenges and and uh, needs and and wants and desires way before your own, whether, you know, and this is whether you're connected with someone at any level at the, of the food chain, um, taking interest in other people, people are always interested to talk about themselves. Yeah. They're always interested in their own problems versus your problems. So I think the mistake I see people make when they're communicating with someone, particularly when they connect with someone of, you know, perceived high stature, a, a guru or a thought leader or an expert in their industry or field that they want to go into is they um, try to tap into that person's knowledge. They try to take from that person rather than giving to that person. And all the relationships that I've made with people of stature throughout my career who are, you know, head and shoulders above myself, 
who I want to connect with, I do it by, you know, making a connection with them and taking interest in, in that particular person. And this works at every particular level. The, the story that I've told a number of times about working at the White House. So I, I'm, when I was leaving the White House at the end of the, near the end of the administration, when I'm leaving to go back to California, to become a speech writer for the governor of California. Um, at the time, one of the things that they did is they would invite VIPs and departing staff and members of Congress and governors and, and, movie stars and stuff to come down to the Oval Office on, I think it was Saturday morning, and the president would record the, the radio address, which had been done all the way back to Franklin Delano Roosevelt. And it was in the Oval Office. And then afterwards, you'd get a picture really quickly with, with the president standing in front of the desk. And um, so it was a really cool opportunity. My family flies out to do this. There's only about 50 people there. And we bring with us a, uh, a, a gift right? Because I've been given a tip. If you bring a gift, you're more likely to have more of a conversation with the president rather than just a quick picture. And so he was collecting DVDs for old Western movies at the time. And so we got a couple old Westerns. We brought them with us. We go down there. He does the radio address, starts doing photos. We gets up to us. We hand him over and boom, we end up having like a long conversation with him about old Western movies. My dad used to be a film critic, so he could talk with anyone about this stuff. And just a normal human conversation just so happens that we are in the middle of the heart of power, in the middle of the Oval Office of the free world, right? And the reason I say that is because oftentimes people struggle. They think like, oh, there's some big potential client, referral partner, leader in my industry, whatever. What do I possibly talk with that person? Well, you know what? Take interest in their interests. Find out what they are interested in. And if you wonder how to possibly know what they are interested in, today it's easier than it ever was because we have this thing called the interwebs and social media and LinkedIn and Facebook and you name it, Twitter, all kinds of research opportunities at your fingertips. Take a little time to learn about the person that you're you know, interested in connecting with and then ask them about that. There's probably something that you are also interested in. Find that thing. It's a great point of connection. That's awesome. Yeah, I like that. The The value piece is critical. And like you said, there's no excuse today in particular to not have something additional or special to be able to roll out that lets that person know, hey, this person has gotten to know me a little bit. They care about me. They care about my interests. And the value add right. is, is tremendous. So it's kind of interesting because you know I go to networking events, not all the time, uh, but I do go when I can. And, you know, part of me feels like there are days when I go and it just feels like I didn't really accomplish all that much. And then mm -hmm. there are times where I feel like, you know, I got a lot more out of it. You know, recently I went to one, a friend of mine was running it. He kind of tapped me for some group conversation at a particular point. So I had more of a role than I typically would have in one of these kinds of events. Um, but how does a person know ultimately if they're networking is making a difference. Like, like, how do you start to measure that you're gaining some traction, whether it's online and with your with your blog, with your email, with your social media, all of that? Obviously, you could look at numbers and views, but sometimes those could be misleading. So, how do you know what the strategies are that are working for you, not working for you? Take us a little bit behind the curtain. Well, ultimately, you have to have some clear end objective in mind, and in in most instances, I think what we're talking about here is someone who's trying to acquire clients or more referrals or more users if they have like a software or something like that. So that's your ultimate goal. You have to be clear on that. Sometimes people are not clear on that. Sometimes they don't have a clear offering and they need to get clear on, on that point. But the other thing that I would point out often, whether we're networking in person, face-to-face -face at an event or a conference or something like that, or an organization, or we're doing it online in a group or a community or a forum or something like that, first question you have to ask yourself is, am I even in the right room? Because oftentimes people are trying to squeeze blood from a turnip. You know, they're going to a you know event and maybe they're going because they've been going for a long time, they've been a member for a long time, but their needs, their change, their goals have changed. And so ultimately it's not the right community for them anymore. And the reason they're not connecting with people who feel like the right fit is because they're in the wrong room and they need to find a different community or a different group to participate in. So I would think about that first, find out if there's some other community or group that you should be participating in. And then you're you're just much more likely to connect with those ideal prospects. And then, you know, frankly, we don't often know immediately whether those relationships are going to pan out. You know, the people that you connect with at 
those types of events. It's, it takes time and follow-up, and follow-up is a critical piece. Um, the other thing I'll say is, you know, I see people who make a mistake often of the needle and haystack approach. They're going to events that might be okay, like a chamber of commerce meeting that has just like a spitfire, just array of different hundreds of different types of people in different industries. And yeah, you might connect, you know, it's like, if you're a chiropractor, you're looking for someone who's got a, a an aching back. Right. It's gonna needle in a haystack. Thanks like, for reminding you know, me. Like, yeah, exactly. Right. <laughs> yeah, I mean, my business partner is a chiropractor, so that's why right, I think I'm aware of, it, of that. Actually, yeah. It's it's a real needle in a haystack approach. So what I prefer, I call it the pile of needles approach. You're going to be a lot more effective if you find that pile of needles. Go somewhere where your ideal prospect is hanging out, not just one or ten, but 10,000, you know? So, you know, for example, if you want to sell software to chiropractors, yeah, you could go to a chamber of commerce event and hope that a chiropractor shows up or someone's friend is a chiropractor or something like that. Or you could go to the annual chiropractor convention in Las Vegas that has 10,000 chiropractors that show up once a year, which is more effective. So I say, you know, take the pile of needles approach rather than the, the, uh, the needle in the haystack approach. Nice. So let's stay with the idea of sort of like bucking conventional wisdom here. Tell me something that is it. very true that you see all the time, but no, nobody really believes you on, or at least initially when you say it, they resist. Yeah. Okay. Well, one is I think that we ought to drop out of more groups. Um, I think it's too easy these days to join groups and communities and forums. Online? Is online, that what you're referring to? Online stuff? Online primarily, okay. but offline too, depending on your habits. Um, not everyone goes to a lot of offline events, but the, some who do go to too many. Um, and so, I, or maybe they go to too many conferences. You know, that sometimes that's the case also. You don't need that many communities in order to be wildly successful. Mm -hmm. I'll give you an example. When I was full-time practicing law, um, I was, you know, I decided that the best community for me was my wife's mother's club. My wife had had a kid recently, but we had a kid, we had a kid, our first child. And, um, she joined this mother's club and it was about 3000 women, many of whom had worked in really high roles, uh, in the San Francisco Bay area. And we're now staying at home with the child and they were constantly making referrals to one another. And it was an amazing referral community. And so I said, I'm going to dive into this one community. And by the way, it was more competitive and cutthroat to get into this community than many other publications I've written for. So I ended up writing for the newsletter and I wrote about any topic I could just to get in the door and all kinds of stuff that was unrelated to practicing law. But eventually I worked my way in, I started making friends and relationships in there. And it got to the point where, um, someone would ask for a recommendation of a lawyer in this side of this forum and three or four other women that I knew that knew me would recommend me, even if it wasn't related to the area of law that I practice. So I say that because you know, find that one community for you. And you don't need 10 other communities. You don't need to be a member of all these other ones and get really involved. You know, join the board or help organize an event or write for their newsletter. Do something like that. Stand out and it'll really make a big, big difference. Another thing that I did when I started practicing law and I was had my own firm and I was only a couple of years out of school and I was here in the local community here, and I would go to, uh, and I started writing for the local bar association newsletter and it really helped me stand out. And I remember going to some uh, gatherings where there were these attorneys who I looked up to who had 25 years of experience, 30 years of experience, had really big law firms, a bunch of people working for them and stuff. And I'd pass them by and I was like, hey, they don't know who I am. And they'd be like, hi, John. And they knew me because they'd seen my writing. Right. They'd, you know, so it really helped to stand out in those communities. And again, you don't need 10 communities. You need one or two. You know, that's really interesting. Really, yeah. I mean, yeah. talking about writing is a great way to get exposure. And going back very briefly to something you said earlier, you talked about using a blog to promote your book. I actually created my book out of my blog because I was great. writing leadership content regularly. And eventually yeah. I found a common thread that I'd be able to utilize and then, you know, fill in the gaps wherever they were and create the book around it. So it's a yep. nice way to do that. And yeah, I mean, I'm a, it's a great way to, you know, to, to develop some of your thought leadership and your, your different ideas. Yeah. And you could repurpose it in a variety of different ways, which I continue yep. to do, even though yeah. the original post was written a number of years ago. And this last point I thought was kind of interesting because I'm, I don't know what you are, but I'm an introvert. 
And so I'm not the kind of person who loves to go into a room and just kind of take over. That's not my style. You know, I do well as a presenter. I do well as a speaker, but fundamentally my energy is not engaged from the room. It's really giving it to the room. And then I leave without much of it left over. So people like me really do struggle with, with, with networking sometimes or feeling like they're just, it's so hard and so, so much energy is required to invest just to be present for people. And so I like the idea of trying to bring it in, really find your niche group, really trying to give to them and become well-known with them. If ultimately they can then in turn support you and give you referrals and things like that. So it really speaks to me and I'm sure many other listeners as well who feel maybe a little uncomfortable or drained from networking, that this is a way that they can do it without feeling like, oh my gosh, it just, it's too hard for me. I'm not going to do it. Yeah. And you know, actually, I think that some of the best networkers that I know are introverts. And the reason is because, you know, we've all seen the big extrovert who makes a huge presence in a room and sucks up all the oxygen and everyone's paying attention to that person. Big, you know, big personality, that kind of thing. And oftentimes those people do a crappy job of following up. And I'll take an introvert who maybe doesn't make a huge first impression, but they do a really good job of keeping in touch, following up, because that's where the money's at. You know, yeah. they do a much better job of that. Was I just actually interviewed um, my business partner, Jeremy, um, for my podcast, for my 200th episode of my podcast. Oh, congratulations. Yes. Thank you. And um, it was my first time interviewing him. And we were talking about this because he's very sociable. But it's funny, his wife accuses him of being introverted, mm. even though he really isn't. But, you know, he... He doesn't feel comfortable. He's not a big personality kind of person where he sucks all the oxygen, gets a lot of attention in a room full of people. But he does a really, really good job one-on-one. And so that's part of the reason that he's done the podcast format because he knows he makes a better impression, lasting impression. So he'd rather follow up with someone or connect with them afterwards in a one-on-one format. So follow what feels comfortable to you. We mentioned writing a moment ago. If you're not a writer, don't write. If you don't like being on video, don't be on video. You know, if you like talking to people, then maybe podcasting is the right format for you. You know, if you like creating visuals and, you know, do a visual format. And if you 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 all like all of them, then do a little bit of everything. Right, right. Because people like to consume content in different ways. Right. But don't let, you know, don't tell yourself that you're an introvert and let that be a crutch or an excuse that allows you to go through life saying, well, I'm just never going to develop relationships because relationships are important. Agreed. It is important to build relationships. So, you know, find the people that you connect with because, you know, no matter how introverted you are, there's someone you connect with. You know, there's very few true introverts. I'm going to make one final comment before we pivot. And that is that I think what you're saying is spot on. And actually from a leadership perspective, because really this is a leadership podcast and that's where I try to keep our focus. I have found, I think research backs this up as well, that introverts tend to be fantastic leaders in many cases, because even though they're not necessarily super dynamic, if you think of good to great and some of the level five leaders that Jim Collins talks about, they're not the yeah. social rock stars that you might normally think of as the heads of, you know, multi-million or billion dollar, you know, whatever it is. But at the same time, they get people, they listen well, they pay close attention, and they make the kinds of connections that other people may not because they're too distracted, they're too focused on themselves, whatever it is. As an introvert and as a listener, I have found, and really I think my coaching helps me with this as well, that I'm watching for clues, I'm listening for tips, I'm trying to read behind the messaging as well, so that I really get to know a person better. And I think that that is a skill, if you have it as an, as an introvert, it may be more intuitive for you, more built into your, to your DNA, use that to your advantage. Because ultimately, like you said, it's if people feel that you get them, they're going to want to do business with you. They're going to want to talk to you. They're going to want to engage Absolutely. with you. So really keep that top of mind as you're, as you're moving your, your conversations forward. Yeah. And you know, to bring it back kind of full circle, um, a lot of people ask me, what was Bill Clinton like in person? Um, and did he really have that charisma that everyone said that he did? And he absolutely did. And I think this is the reason why he went from, you know, poverty in rural Arkansas to, you know, the highest office in the land. And the reason is because he made, he, he paid attention to people. And I saw him in a room numerous, numerous times where he would walk down a rope line, talking to different people. Every single person afterwards felt like they had a moment with him, felt like, 
he, all his attention was focused on that person. And um, even beyond the larger crowds, when he connected with people one-on-one, he just did an amazing job of that. Still, to this day, continues to do an amazing job of that. They used to joke when Newt Gingrich was Speaker of the House and he'd go in and he would negotiate with Bill Clinton. His own staff was worried because they felt like Gingrich would go in all bombastic and have like these you know harsh ideas and stuff that he would they would be ready to fight with Clinton on, and then he would kind of be swayed, I guess, by his personality. Mm -hmm. And he'd come out making some concessions that his staff felt like he shouldn't. Um, So it it, it just goes back to what you said about leadership is like, it goes a long way when you can take interest in someone, show an interest in that person, and, and then be able to use that to show that connection. People, they trust you, they're more likely to follow you, they're more likely to follow your lead. Beautiful. That was a great way to end the segment, John. Thank you. So now we great. are going to move into our rapid fire segment. And here the responses are short and to the point. The best investment you ever made other than in a stock or real estate? I guess I would have to say my relationships, right? I would have to say, you know, investing the time. Um, you know, I've spent over, well, hundreds and hundreds of hours um, doing interviews of uh, everything from authors, speakers, you name it, uh, business leaders. And, and those relationships have just been phenomenal. On a scale of one to 10, how organized are you? <laughs> if you looked at my desk right now, you probably wouldn't say I'm all looking. that high. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, I managed to get things done most of the time. So, uh, and, you know, through law school and stuff. So I'd say maybe a, an eight, okay. eight and a half. Good. At least, yeah. Something that most people don't know about Bill Clinton. Um, there was a quote in George Stephanopoulos' book um, where he said that uh, he never saw Bill Clinton um, in private, and he was with him in private for hours and hours, you know, in the 92 campaign and, and afterwards. Never saw him say a bad thing about anyone. Um, you know, so you can imagine the types of people that you meet, you know, people on, on rope line campaigning, stuff like that, who might say things that might be perceived as a little bit off, right? He never afterwards in private turned to someone and said, did you see that person? Did you see that crazy person? Never. Nice. I I believe that because I was around him enough to know that that's how he was. Um, I'm not saying, I'm not saying the man's a saint. He obviously has his own flaws. Um, but you know, as far as leadership goes, that's something that I aspire to do myself. I, I often think of that, you know, when I, I, I encounter someone who it's easy to make some flip comment or to make fun of them, marginalize them for whatever reason. I, I try and remind myself of that and, and try and prevent doing that. I think that that is really true leadership. And taking the high road is critical. And the last one, a quote that you live by or think about often. Um, So this is kind of a funny one, but I had it written actually up on my door in college. And it's from uh, that great scholar and thinker, uh, Yoda, who said, (laughs) do or do not. I think it was, hold on, I'm going to screw it up now. Was it do uh I see I'm gonna screw it up now. I think it was uh try or try not. Now see I, I don't even remember it now. Got it. We'll have to get it was we'll have to like, get into the show notes. <laughs> Whatever it, it'll be that one. Whatever that one. But yeah, I mean someone has to look it up. More people are gonna listen to it and look for it than before. Yeah, That's right, sure. right. Okay. Try so, or try not. There is no try do or something like that. You know, Yoda, he talked in kind of a weird cryptic for yeah, fashion. Yeah. So I know you've told us about a lot of the things that you do. Where can people find you online, learn more about your work and connect with you? Well, after I botched that Yoda quote, I don't think they're going to be interested, but uh, Smart Business Revolution is my blog and podcast. You can check it out on iTunes or Stitcher. Um, and uh, Rise25 is the website for my business with Jeremy Weiss. Fantastic. So before we let you go, one last life lesson, leadership lesson that you could share with us, John, after a fantastic and engaging conversation today. Um, so be proactive. Don't allow life to happen to you and don't expect 
those critical relationships, the mentors, the peers, the friends to come, don't wait for them to come knocking on your door. Go out there and proactively develop those relationships, whether it's using something like a podcast, which is a tremendous tool, or by joining those communities and those organizations where you're going to connect with those people. Go out there and do it. Great. Now's the time. It's interesting because oftentimes, that was a great lesson, but sometimes when I have a guest, I, I don't know them so well, at least at that point. So I can't determine if they're really living by the lesson that they share. But it's clear in your case that that is true because you live this. This is what you do, making those connections. And I would agree, being proactive is the way to go. Thank you so very much for joining me today for this conversation on Lead to Succeed. It's really, really been a pleasure and looking forward to getting to know you better over time. My pleasure. Yeah, thank you. All the best now. Thanks so much for listening to this episode and for investing in yourself so that you can lead to succeed. Before you go, don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review the show. Your feedback gives the show more social proof and encourages more folks to listen. 